Hello and welcome to the Life Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Jack O'Halloran, and today I will be talking with my dear friend and partner in crime, John Phelan. We will chat about John's history, how he became what he's doing today, which would be nutrition, physiotherapy, and bike fitting. We will look into bike fitting as a treatment modality and dissect it for you in terms of what a session would look like, how you can improve your cycling results from it, and reduce the chance of injury. We will also get into the nitty gritty of what it is to be a competitor in the fields of adventure racing, cycling and so on. Chatting about the game of chess in the last couple of kilometres and how you can make the most of your performance in order to get you on that podium. If you like what we do here in the show, I would call on you to support us. We are at LifeFit Studios on Instagram or you can find my personal page. That's Jack O'Halloran underscore IE. You can find John. He is the Bike Fit Physio. Or you can also find our websites, that is lifefitstudios.ie and thebikefitphysio.com. You can also find us on Patreon, where if you'd like to donate and help us sustain the show here, we would be eternally grateful. So, without further ado, I would invite you now to open your ears and open your hearts and enjoy the show. Hey John, how are you? Just, I'm I'm uh, pent up upstairs in the in the house. Lovely view, but uh, I'm uh, I'm keeping well. I'm keeping well. Yourself, Jack? I'm keeping well. You're, or, um, I'm hanging in there. I'm looking out the window. The birds are flying, and the bees are there somewhere. But uh, they're probably up to promiscuous acts, no doubt. Um, I was that. I was out. I saw them. There's loads of actually. The the insects are about. I was out painting the shed, and uh, it's definitely a sign of spring. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a silver lining there. Um, well, John, you are the bike fit physio. Um, for those of of our audience who don't know you, um, you might maybe start off by telling us a bit about yourself and kind of where you started out and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Uh. Well, I was. I thought this question might come up right, and I was out cycling the bike solo this morning, and thought, you know, maybe I I haven't given this uh, history of myself in a while, but here's a chance to do it. I uh. I fell into physio, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I was sort of in nutrition, studying away there in 1996 to 2000. And uh, didn't, um, then my sister started calling me like Del Boy because I was always sort of up to stuff, sort of trying to make a, make a, a new business venture. Or, I mean, myself and my friend, we were caddying in the States and we were like, let's come back with some uh, a, a business venture selling bagels, but like all these things kind of failed, and uh, it, it it but it, but but the name stuck. So I uh, went from that point into working in a health food shop because after coming out of a degree in nutrition in two thousand, Ireland wasn't really ready for it. If anyone can remember that year, there just wasn't the demand for nutrition and health. So I got thinking maybe, so I got into gym instruction uh, because I thought that's the next best bet, like combine nutrition with gym instruction and let's see where that goes. And it got me up to a point where I was like, uh, better maybe go a bit further into this. And uh, my friend was gen- genuinely walking up the stairs in the house I was living with at the time. And he goes, uh, do you know? I, I'm going over to Leeds to study dietetics and they do physio there. It's like, Jesus, that's a good idea. And that was how I fell into physio. Got into the course, completed those two years. It was a master's. And then um, I remember getting a job then in the, in, up in Scotland. So that was it, off up to there and working in the NHS. And it was a brilliant start. But eventually I got kind of worn down by the the relentlessness of the NHS, you know, just back to back patients every day. And I thought there's something wrong. I was kind of getting a bit, uh, I kind of felt like I needed to even leave. I was considering leaving the course and doing a master's in public health. And then my friend said to me, uh, there's actually a guy there doing a science of cycling course uh, at Edinburgh University Hospital. And that was how. I went along to that. Like I wasn't looking to go in that direction at all. And so I went along, 
Paul Vizentini is the guy I owe my current kind of direction to because he was a real charismatic Australian who delivered that course and it was just brilliant. Like it was really showing how physiotherapy is heavily involved in bike fitting and cycling was something I did anyway. And then I started to think, oh, all right, could maybe go down the kind of a private road here. So I went into private physio in Edinburgh and sure didn't they then want to set up a bike fitting service after about a year like and i put my name forward and uh uh i if I, it's kind of embarrassing actually to think about the first bike that i did for them you know uh do you want me to tell you a little bit <laughs> oh absolutely yeah but you, you always have to start somewhere god almighty I, I made loads of mistakes in my early days and i think if you don't there'll be something wrong you know yeah this is it like some there's some train of thought is that you shouldn't do something until you're a hundred percent ready but i don't know i don't think i've lived by that i kind of find that if you, yeah be, be 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 safe but get stuck in and get get the thing moving you know so uh well i i kind of yeah like I, I was i knew what i wanted to do with the guy he came in with his bike but then we were using a turbo trainer which is like an indoor uh rig that you can put the bike on and i was there removing his wheel even though the turbo trainer didn't require that at all and he goes to me uh in a scottish accent like what what you're doing there and i was like uh just and then this is where you have to bluff then i was like oh, all right yeah i'm just just checking that your wheel is sound and that it's that it's uh still working and then managed to get back on track and uh yeah that was that was that was bike fit client number one and then I was th- doing my numbers last night, and I'm up to 487. Wow. So there's there's your quick whistle stop. Yeah, 487. History. And, and I, like, out of that, you obviously, you, you fitted yourself. Um, And to go into that a little bit is that you mentioned you were into the cycling beforehand, but you're still into that side, aren't you? Into the adventure racing, um, all that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and to, to bring it back to the bike fitting, have you noticed how... I suppose being ergonomically set up for it, especially if you have something that's long distance, one percent over a hundred miles can make a huge difference. That's a, a free mile, so to speak. Um and in that time period, maybe you can elaborate for me, how long has it taken to get up to those uh, four and five hundred numbers from that, you know, that very shaky and nervy first episode? Yeah, so it was you could look at the number and look and get an average per year, but actually it was very much top heavy heavy really like the first initial year was slow you know just drip 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 feed clients coming into me um i will get to where you were going with the what how important it is but like i can remember you know this jack as well like setting up your business you know i remember being out in edinburgh and i knew i was going to come home we'll say january 16 i was like right how do we get this thing ready like is there a website url bike fit physio you know that was available and you just start connecting them up um and then got home and probably the best thing i did do was set up with a event organizer called elite events and they do many events in ireland and one of them was the ring of bear cycle it's pretty popular there and in may and i i went down to that and they allowed me set up a stall at that event and so then i got to meet people and I just started to think like, yeah, this this could work, all right, because people were interested in it. That's a big thing, I think, that, you know, for anyone listening who, who has started a business themselves or is considering it, the sense of humility that you need because you you know you're going to make mistakes. You know, well, maybe you don't. A lot of us, when we start, we, we think we're fantastic and that we're impermeable. But when we make that mistake and it's that ability to see past it and keep going. And what would your, your advice be to anyone who, you know, is maybe just finished up their their first day at work in their own business, and you know, when they come home and they feel like an idiot, or they feel like, God, where do I go from here? Maybe I made the wrong choice and regrets, and and this kind of mental battle that can ensue. You know, would you, if you were to look back at that time, would you have spoken to yourself differently then, or you know, how would you advise anyone in that position? No, I can I, I can remember at the time being almost surprised when an email would come in saying 
you know, can I book an appointment for a bike fit? So I wasn't confident. I very confident. I do tend to have a kind of an optimism with me that I think is carried through. Like, you know, so to answer your question about what would you say to a person who's just finished their first day of their new business and they feel a little bit silly, that's just the first day. Like, I mean, this is cliche, but you got to give it a bit of time. They say a lot of businesses do fail initially. And I, I, you hear all that. I would have went to a lot of business uh, net, uh, business courses there with in Edinburgh and also in, in Cork with the local enterprise office. And that, I would actually say that helped a lot because they fill you with that information that, yeah, keep going, do your market research. You know, you can even get a mentor. I use that, which to be honest, wasn't great to be honest, but. You can get lucky and get a really interesting mentor who will help you. So first day, yeah, you'll feel like this is, this mightn't work, but give it give it time. And I think, you know, if you have something beyond yourself that you're doing it all for, you know, it, you'll kind of stay on the hard road. Um, I think maybe that's a problem with some people. They think they're in it for the money or they think that it's going to provide them this lifestyle or whatever. And there's no substance behind why they're doing it. Um, you know, and maybe to touch on that for yourself, and you, you kind of mentioned in the early days when you were kind of, you might see an opportunity and you'd go for it. You might not necessarily known yourself why you were doing it, but you, you certainly seem to have found that why since. And and based on that, then what would you, what would your best description of that be? You know, um, I know you have a, a young girl at home, and that that's obviously changed things for you. Um, and even things like family or things like helping other people that can be a a huge kind of motivator to get up in the morning and to forgive your mistakes and to drive on. But what would your thoughts on that kind of phenomenon be? Yeah, man. Um, Cause you talk, you mentioned the why and my cousin does as well. And she's a, a yoga instructor there. And yeah, it's really, really important. And I, I thought about it afterwards. I got, I got going into this head over heels, but then, then I was like, yeah, this is, this works for me because a, I am passionate about cycling. I've been doing this with, since I remember I found the BMX in my, in the garage at home and it was proper from the early days and a rally activator. If anyone knows those guys, I used to like that. And I was cycling to school and everything was cycling. So when I, that was a big why, like I'm now doing something that's involving uh, a passion of mine, but also it does give me a little bit of a break from my physiotherapy um, daily kind of routine. So seeing patients who I will always be a physio first and a bike fitter second, but it can be challenging to have a lot of patients who are, you know, typically always coming in with a pain or a problem or, you know, so to have a biker coming in who's, who sometimes could be happy out and just wants to perform better. So now you're dealing with a different type of client, you know? That's a great point because even knowing how you operate and, and knowing how I operate and we're, we're very much the same in that is that when we have a physio session, you know, we're not just looking, okay, there's the muscle with the problem and I'll apply this treatment and fix that. And that will work for Mary, John, Bob and, and Philip. But the thing is you're dealing with humans, you know, and that, that drains you, I suppose, that whole phenomenon that, you know, I remember thinking early days setting up business that I wouldn't want any more than four or five physio patients a day because you wouldn't be able to give each one the right value because you'd be exhausted. You'd be carrying on the work. And I suppose I have my own ways of helping mitigate that and blowing off my steam. I mean, for me, it's music and guitar and banjo and things like that. And for you, it, it's it's clearly the bike fit and you have other things around that as well. Family and different things, as we, as we mentioned, but making beer and uh mountain biking it is very important to have that you know people lose sight of it and we think oh it's all about the work it's all about the work it's all about this but the work will burn you out and especially the more meaningful it is and so on but to have you know in a sense the the bike can maybe split that up a bit you know because the person is just coming in and the goal is the performance now of course you have there is emotional attachments to performance and outliers and that too that may come, come up in any bike fit but I suppose compared to to a physio session, which most listeners will have a, an idea of how that can go, be it that old model of, oh, this is your problem, it's a disc and I'll fix it by doing this, or whether it's the more whole human approach that we apply, 
How would you describe to our listeners who haven't ever been to one or who, you know, are interested in being to one? How would you describe the bike fitting process kind of from start to finish? So I suppose if you give it one of my tip, a typical client then would be someone who is coming in with, 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 with some symptoms, you know, they're not happy days cycling around with no pain or issues. So they do tend to have that. And that's why they probably find me as a, as a physio bike fitter. So they come in and I will, I like to, uh, really get them comfortable and welcomed with a coffee and we sit down. I think the coffee and cycling was a real kind of obvious combo to, to, to do. And so we, we'd sit down and we'd go over the history and just like, tell us what's going wrong. And when do you get your, we'll say, uh, numbness in your hands? When does it come on? Um, how long into the cycle will it come on and just get the history, you know? And then, uh, from that point, I'll then move into what we call the pre bike fit screening. So that's where I'll use the physiotherapy head and go over like from neck down to ankles. Say for instance, if someone is getting numbness in their hands, you just want to rule out that it's not coming from a neck issue. And it's just strictly due to pressure in that area on the bike. So we'll use that, we'll screen them, and then we'll look at areas that are really important for cycling as well. So that's where performance stuff like the calf muscle is a really key muscle and how well they can uh, work their hip muscles in a compromised position, which is what the case is on a bike, you know. So it's real. that's where I got this. That information came from the science of cycling and all that stuff. So that's your screening, and I'll document all these findings and we can then compile a report with this stuff later then we go in and set the bike up uh, measure it up so we have a pre bike fit measurements and then sit the, the cyclist up and put on these markers onto key bony points you know like so that the cameras can pick them up so we let them warm up and then I'll, I'll uh, take a you know, an observation of my own, but I don't really work from that. I'll have to use a camera and I'll record them cycling. And then we can look at that and slow it down and look at the the angles of the certain um, joints. So, for instance, one of the best purchases I've made hands down has been a, a saddle pressure mapping uh, device that... Um, actually had to borrow from my wife it was that it was the german made so they don't like come cheap but it was it was worth doing it really has paid back the investment so so far because i can objectively say to that person we'll say with the the numbness in their hands that there's this much force is going through their saddle because this saddle mapping pressure go, sits on their saddle so i can then see how much pressure is going through it so if there's not enough going through their bum and too much going through their hands because there's only three contact points saddle handlebars and feet so you can safely say oh yeah look there's too much pressure going through your hands here uh hence the reason why you're getting numbness when you're cycling Do you, you get me so that was that that's only one of the things that saddle mapping can tell me is it really helped me with saddle sores and numbness in that, in the pelvic area. But anyway, that we can talk to late, later if you want, but then we can address the, the measurements on the bike to a put more of that person on the saddle and less through their hands on the handlebars. We can put the saddle up, down, forward, back. We can lower the handlebars, raise them. And, I'm using my angles then every time I make a change, I'll re-record them and I'll redo a pressure reading and I can then see are we going in the right direction. Awesome. And kind of going from there. So that's your 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 bike adjustments to suit the person. I assume then you're trying to mitigate that with, you know, more person adjustments to suit those adjustments, if you know what I mean, as in maybe somebody needs to learn how to do a pelvic tilt or a certain thoracic position or things like that is there yeah definitely like um so this one of the in the screening i will look that i'll have looked at their thoracic mobility so like that's a big one for cycling because like typical typical cyclists is you know your 
your well, my typical client would be like uh death space i suppose because you know they're like mid mid 40s 50s work uh guys and girls and like they're can be stiff in that area of their mid spine so if you're very stiff there you're gonna struggle to maybe your, your your neck will typically be doing more work you know because your mid spine is not doing enough so that's one area to allow uh, show them how to improve on so that their bike can actually change as they improve their mobility in that area mm. and i think that's what kind of will set the likes of you apart from a different bike fit is that you have that physio background you have that that you know biomechanical background biological background and so on and that that's clearly adding value even right from the screening, you know, the likes of being able yeah. to rule out a red flag, which is absolutely yeah. huge. And then the likes of that, you know, empathy that they teach within physio and different things that you can listen to a person, listen to how it bothers their performance and bothers their ego and all of that kind of thing. It seems to be building into quite a nice package there. Yeah. And like, it's not novel, you know, if you look in Australia, I guess that's why that guy came out of Sydney, you know, that taught me this stuff is that that's a big combination is bike fitting who are physios, you know, so you could, it's, it, yeah, you can see why, because there's science, there is a lot of science in bike fitting, you know, that's backed up by research as, as there is with physiotherapy. So a nice little marriage there. Um, and like you said it there earlier, I wanted to bring it up again when you, you can't like, I suppose there, I haven't found that there is as much um, emotional drainage, if that's a word, from my part, of, from my point, you know, that you would get with a persistent pain patient. You know, you've treated them, I've treated them. They, they're carrying pain for 10 years plus, and they have a lot of uh, thoughts, beliefs. And with a bike fit... You, I find you don't have to go down those roads as much because they're coming in and they don't really see me as a physio, I suppose. Now I could op- we we could talk about them, but tend to just make them happier on the bike, and then if they wanted a follow up, that could happen. You get me? Yeah. It does tend to stay a bike fitting as a primary um, part of it. Because it becomes kind of easier then to mitigate the you know the weight on your own shoulders because yeah you know those those persistent pain cases they are as we mentioned before they're quite draining you know you have to yeah you have to really get in there with the person and and it's draining for them too because you, you'll see all sorts you'll see flushes you'll see tears you'll see laughter yeah. you'll see panic you'll see all of these things and geez sometimes you even you know you might need a, a 10 minute or a 10 day break after some of those patients whereas with the bike fitting you're still able to get your 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 physio knowledge true, which is beautiful, and get that whole side true. But with let's say, you know, the, there's a, there's a happiness to. Oh, there's a, they they're doing something they love as well, you know. So yeah, is that what you're gonna? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's a there's a different baby in the ring that it's not just yeah. me and my feelings. It's actually the yeah, bike. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Can, can distract from that. Yeah. Now, I, I I do think there is one thing I wanted to get across uh is that there's a sort of um acceptance in cycling that it's totally normal to have like really uncomfortable backside when you're cycling like to the point where if you can't even feel your own genitals that can be considered normal in the cycling community and that is where it just has to stop because like there's loads of research done now on the saddle and uh, and that's part of the reason why I invested in the saddle mapping was to see the reasons why people are getting these symptoms and that's why i have to ask the person twice literally i ask them twice have you any saddle issues or discomfort because especially in the female um population they tend to just hide it so yeah it's an interesting one because like no that's spoiling their enjoyment of the of the activity you know and uh, you can get great help from saddle positional changes or saddle changes. Hmm. And I suppose running out that session then, so you went from your screening to your setup. So that was obviously your, you know, you're, you're taking many measurements with your markers, which would be the likes of your saddle, your cameras, your different things like that. Then you're going through that. Yeah. Knee angles. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
No, yeah, because I think on those markers, you're typically looking at the angle of, say, the lower limb, like you've got your knee. So the angle of the hip, knee, ankle. Yeah. So that's an angle and your ankle angle and your hip angle. And these are all, these all have normative values that you, you can pretty much get them in a, in a, in a ballpark region and then use the saddle mapping to really uh, get the fine tuning. Does that, that's kind of what, where we're at there with the markers. And then it's kind of, so you're, you're, you're going in your, Obviously, so you adjust what what you feel will make a difference, then you remeasure, and and it's a process of that until you find, I suppose, the magic recipe. And and kind of what happens then is it, you know, have you some feedback system where, you know, you let the person go out, they measure it in the real world because that's going to be different when they're out on hills and bumpy roads and things like that, as opposed to just a turbo trainer. And then what's what's your feedback loop? What's your your way of kind of making sure that that's still keeping going? You know. Yeah, no. Um, well, I ha I did buy another toy that can do that, but I I'm not sure. It won't be for everybody. Um, basically, it's kind of a IMU, these uh, inertia monitoring unit or something. So they're, they, 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 you can actually place them on certain parts of your body. You'll say so. You can put one on your sacrum, which is your lower back, and you could put one on your shoe and the other shoe and and then you go out cycling and it'll pick up the angles so it'll tell oh are you maintaining this bike position that we've set you up in or are you kind of collapsing out of it and going back to old ways you know yeah now i'd then need to look at this data and see so it's a lot of a lot of work so it might well come into play with certain cyclists who really want that extra um extra mile but to be honest, I would be, I'm very, I'm fairly confident let, let when they leave the studio that when this, well, I go back to it again, but the saddle mapping is very accurate. It, it, it can actually show up how stable they are on the saddle and if they're twisting or are they rocking. And if we can get them really stable and that their angles are within those normative re- regions, their ranges, and then they understand what, it is has just gone on in the session then you're usually you're you're good because i don't i don't i don't get a lot of emails back saying look this hasn't worked you know there has been one or two over the years but and that's normal because you can have a little mistake or you can have um a person not adapting to the new position or maybe they've we've been too aggressive with the new position yeah well i i, I go off of probably yeah communication i ask the patient to get back to me within two weeks uh, a true email and let me know and they can come in if they have to just like retweet things you know i'd find that that you know the the loading issue could be a big thing is that a lot of people aren't aware what it is that yeah so if you're changing an entire way the system is running surely you no know, this would be my best guess but surely you can't continue at the previous rate of exertion in this new platform and movement because there's so much new things happening that you kind of need to give that nervous system a chance don't you yeah yeah like the easy one to explain that one would be and i've done it a lot it's like i'll bring up the saddle by like well maybe like say you could go go a nice hefty two centimeters or three centimeters you know and that might not seem like much but that's a big change in when you look at the like i think you mentioned you know the minute a mile out of a hundred miles you know imagine what's happening every 10 seconds on a bike it's you're you're spinning the pedals a lot i don't know the numbers it amounts to thousands of revolutions right so if you then think about the knee angle and the hamstrings are now having to kind of lengthen that a little bit more because the seat is higher uh, they might not they might might not like that so i always say like look this seat has gone up a decent amount so just just give it time don't go out and do your usual 150k on a sunday maybe just re just introduce it slowly and if you feel anything at the back of your knee you'll know that that's just the hamstrings kind of adjusting you know yeah which which again is showing great value in in the physio side of it along with it you know and being able to say somebody to somebody say if, if the change was a saddle height difference and you know that that's going to be you know where in the body that that'll be asking more questions of you can then say right i can extrapolate that and give 
you know, some exercises on the side or give some particular stretch or some other different thing they could be doing that will help mitigate that new change as well. And I think that's that's huge value because people's head is on the bike and, and their head is up their arse and, and they think that, oh, you just fix that and that's it. But yeah, it's kind of the coping mechanisms that were happening all along that you also need to bring along with that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's because you, you were, if you were to follow where you were going, the next step is the report uh, when they leave, you know. And so I go home. I don't tend to do it at the clinic. I tend to have those for work at home. But I'll I'll, I'll bring up that uh, the measurements that we took during the day, and then write up a report on it, like summarize the findings. Say like, oh look, you only have, you managed fifty degrees on your hamstring straight leg raise test. So now you need to do some uh, Romanian deadlift to help improve that hamstring length if you can. You know, and uh, we we'll write up that and some recommendations, and then. They also get like a report on the saddle map changes and the bike picture, you know, the picture pre and post. Yeah. Um, and some recommendations, really. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And I suppose moving on a bit from the bike fit, I think we have covered most of it. And if there's anything more, you're, you're more than welcome to add. But maybe if we could touch in a little bit on your own kind of performance, your own journey within racing, um, where you started off with that, where you are now. I know you're you're hitting the podium quite often now as well, which is awesome to see. Um, once. <laughs> once, once or yeah. twice. You, you've, you've been fairly close and, and robbed, I've heard. Yeah. I've heard you were absolutely robbed. Close and robbed, exactly. <laughs> Everyone else was drugged to the nines and you were the only innocent one I heard. Um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe you can just introduce us a bit to that and what it, you know, what your journey has been, how you've improved or maybe not in other areas mm. over time. Um and what it kind of offers you, what reprieve it offers you, and so on. Yeah, it's, it's so strange. Like, I, my, this is my first podcast, and like, I, it's just a nice space to talk, isn't it? Like, it's real, probably not used to it, really. I'm more of a kind of a listener, and that's, <laughs> that's what got us into our jobs. Maybe you're, you might relate to that, but it's nice to kind of blab on about, <laughs> isn't it? It's all about being out of a comfort zone. Yeah, sure. Look, I'll tell you then. I, I, uh, what, what did I do? I started cycling. Uh, uh, just getting to work, you know, in Scotland. And then I just thought, ah, let's give the racing a shot, like cycling, like actual bike racing, not adventure racing. And that's where you really learn how you definitely, uh, what's the word, you really doubt, or you really like ask yourself questions like, am I any good at this? Because you do a race and I thought, oh, A4, like, you know, the, the category, that's the lowest category. I was like, oh, look, I'll easily come somewhere in this. And you just get blown out the back uh, towards the end of a race. It's real, real chess game. Like you, you, it's all a big swarm of cyclists going around the course, and then next thing with about four k to go, it just splits up, and you're left just sucking air in from Africa at the end of the, at the back of the pack. Like, huh. uh, and I also noticed that that was dodgy. Like there was some stream, extreme kind of crashes, and I was getting close calls and before i said to myself this isn't worth it for my career in physio i did have a my last race was actually in dungarvan and i uh i finally cracked the the game of chess you know you 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 wait till that last 3k and then you start to move up through the pack and uh yeah i got to a sprint finish and and i i came sixth but got a real buzz from it mm. so then i thought how do i yeah how do i keep this going but not break collarbone and be out of work so uh the next thing was to look at triathlon but sort of swapped it for adventure racing because um that was right yeah the dingle adventure race was the first one uh just by chance had to crack it going it was more for the crack really and dingle and that night you know uh but definitely got some sort of a a want for it because you, you you got to use your cycling you you were in a racing situation but not as condensed you know and then you also got to run in off-roady stuff which is i guess that was my mountain biking background that i loved that kind of trail and ah it's just magic to be that close to nature and but in a race setting so you're running down mountains and then kayaking was a uh, it was just thrown in it's just thrown in there it's about a kilometer only really but it's you can get good at it like but it's not something i focus too much on 
Yeah, and you, once you landed into the adventure racing, you kind of never really look back because I know you're 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 even running workshops on it now, and you're teaching people running analysis. You're teaching people like running technique, cycling technique, the different stuff involved. But then also stuff like you know, how do you prepare for it? Yeah, you mentioned you're a nutritionist. That obviously comes into it big time in terms of preparing for a race like that. Maybe even choosing the right race because there is there's different tiers, isn't there? There's you know like an easy, medium, and hard. And some people who may go for the first time their ego might tell them do the really easy one or their ego might tell them do the really hard one. And sometimes it's not the right decision. And it's about knowing those things too, I think, you know? Yeah. And maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, because uh, it's actually something that we, myself and another guy, want to maybe highlight in some of the, the big adventure racing, not naming any organizers, but there's, you know, some people tend to maybe not prepare enough because they... A, the ego, maybe you're saying there, like, I might go for the big one, you know, the one that's like 70 kilometers over a lot of altitude, you know, mountain up and down running and a lot of biking. And, and like, this is where if you're not prepared and you, you mentioned uh, loading, you know, overloading there earlier, didn't you, on the bike? And if you're, but it's way more severe with running. If you're, if you're not, if you haven't done the build up, then you can really expose yourself and end up with, an overuse injury so that's something that i think they probably need to get across to the get that message out maybe a bit clearer mm. you know and and out of that then what you know if you were saying to and i might include myself in this because i haven't done one yet and everyone of course is pushing me to do one but i'm probably too fit for them anyway but oh yeah oh no owen owen wants you to anyway i know that for sure <laughs> they, they might eventually twist my arm or my nipples or whatever is necessary <laughs> to get me to do it but oh, yeah. what would be your advice so based on pretty much you've already pretty much hit on it but your advice to somebody starting out and say they were going for you know somewhere in the start or middle tier what would you say to them in the sense of how long before you'd want to start training where you'd want to start that and, and at what rate you'd want to build up and, you know, from there, the variety of different exercises and things that needed to be added into that big picture. How would you, how would you describe that to a complete newbie? All right. Well, the quickest way would be get onto the YouTube page, you know, and look up the videos because I've made a whole series of videos uh, helping people kind of prepare for these adventure racing. But anyway, I, I, but, to, but because of the blog here, the podcast, podcast let's, let's chat over the steps that someone could take how many weeks you'd want you'd agree you here would you want you'd want about 12 weeks wouldn't you to kind of make to allow ad- adaptation longer would be better like 18 weeks would be, ma- would be magic but if you had to get a nice 12 weeks and you started with uh say you i think you said in kind of a medium level sort of so you're 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 going to need to put in the work so say if that's the middle distance adventure race, uh, you would need to start with, let's say you're you're running, and like you'd want to, if you've got no history of running, then I think the couch to five k is a fantastic program because it's really uh, you could probably skip a few of the levels initially and get into it, and then once you've once you've that done, you just start to gradually increase the the kilometers, uh, runners tend to use a kind of a 10 percent rule but it's a little bit on the conservative side so maybe like 15 to 20 percent you could add on to your kilometers every week uh, i know we're kind of uh, there's a whole area of this isn't there really that we could go into here jack but like well would you agree 15 20 percent in terms of just keep an eye on your kilometers and, and start to add that way yeah like generally i suppose what i found is it depends on the person. If the person is just doing one facet or one sport, like just running, or if the person is doing a bit of this and a bit of that, maybe they do an hour of yoga and they, you know, walk their dog and then they have a kick around and they do loads of different stuff like a swim and different things. The number tends to need to come, you know, it can broaden that little bit. So you could say a 10 to 20% range. But mm-hmm. I think really the numbers are less important what's more important is yeah. if the person is tuned into how they're feeling listening yeah and if they know that they're able to recover that they're not stressed they can regain their breath regain things like that yeah. and they just box clever about it mitigate it out over as long as you can i think that's probably the best strategy and um, without being overly specific on any 
ratios and numbers and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I could, I'd probably give my own example actually, because uh, you know, I mentioned the Dingle Adventure Race, right? And I, I stupidly, really, when I think about it, this is like before I was competitive. I, I, I just turned up, right, and did the long Dingle Adventure Race, which involves coming down Mount Brandon. And uh, I ran it. I ran down the thing, and uh, I could feel a little, maybe a bit of soreness inside my right knee at the time. And finished that nine mile run into Dingle, and then sure enough, that night, like a lot of discomfort. We we can talk about it. It was the, you know, the pes and serinus, the kind of tendons that that join up. They call it the goose's foot, just inside the knee, just below the knee. Yeah. I basically overloaded that. Uh, I think it was the, uh, one of the adductors or the hamstring. It, was, it didn't matter. It was basically an overload of the tendons coming in there. And that was my, and I ended up writing a blog on it because it's so much learning in that, you know, that you cannot expect, even though I had done a lot of cl- jogging, I, I wasn't doing any hills. So that's a whole new ball game running down a hill. You need to expose that to your body in your training basically that's a gr- that's a great point is that you you try and say yeah so so what's the 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 final race or the outcome S- try and count how many variabilities are in that complex system extrapolate those out and then try and master them all as components as best you can but as you say it's so easy to forget oh yeah i've done loads of running but yeah where was that running was it up and down and was it in soft ground or hard ground was yeah were your feet wet and cold or were they not you know all these yeah, 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 yeah. things that Maybe we can only truly learn them all with experience, but maybe that's what our role here today is to try and simplify it for those who, you know, can't wait to get out of this quarantine we're in at the moment and go run down Brandon Mountain and different things like that. Yeah, like it, and you don't want to stop that either because there's a real that enthusiasm is 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 golden. But yeah, just like you can get away with it though. That's the thing. Some people do, uh, but then you will get those who, who do turn up on the physio uh appointments because they have basically they've shocked you know i like to use the phrase uh tendons the tendons in our body they they're like someone who you know those people who hate change yeah like they're like those like they don't like any sudden change so you should really treat them i remember writing one blog and i was like they're like your ex-girlfriend who who hate who 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 always wants to go to bed at nine o'clock in, in the evening. Do you know those? Oh, I don't know if you've been with anyone like that, or, but they always want to go to bed at nine o'clock and uh, you want to stay up a bit later. But you need, if you imagine your attendance like your ex-girlfriend, you need to change the wa- their watch just by about 20 minutes. Just, yeah. And then slowly, yeah, over time, she'll be staying up till about midnight with you. Do you get me? I do, yeah. <laughs> it's a funny way to look at it, but but you're dead right. I mean, it is that just try and mitigate that the, because there is a polarity to it. You know, there's what there's what we want to do in our heads, and yeah. we think we we can run two hundred miles, but our body is used to the last however many years it's been adapting, yeah. and it's used to the rate at which it's adapting, and which is also an issue with injury because you see someone who gets injured, maybe somebody tears a hamstring, they're out for six weeks, and when they go back. They tried to go back to the person they were six weeks ago, and before they know it, they're injured again because their nervous system has adapted back to a, a lazier version of themselves. And it's a very, very good point to know is that if we can always stay on the edge of our ability, on the edge of uncertainty where, where growth happens without ever going too far in, because sometimes we're just not ready for the deep end and it'll swallow us whole. Yeah. Um. That That is a great point. And I think there are ways in which we can learn to communicate with that process. I mean, Something like checking in with the breath, like is our breath stuttered and, you know, stressful when we're going through a stimulus or things like our vision. Is our visual vision narrowed and tunnel vision or is it wide and are we calm Are our shoulders drop back or they yeah. pinned up to our ears? There's all these little signs that we can learn over time that can tell us if we're coping well or not with it. But the point is. If you've accepted that, right, I'm going to throw myself into this fire and it's. 10 weeks out, just box clever about it. You know, you don't have to be yeah. in a competition with yourself and, and grab your balls in your hand and, and say, oh, you can do anything. It's not about that. It's about being clever because surely for anyone who wants to do their first race, they should be thinking about their 50th race, not their first one. And if they can still see a reality of them racing 
in 10 years time that's what they want to sustain they don't want to sustain yeah. this this one ego push they want to sustain it for the long term and you have to be clever with that i think you have to be a bit calmer you have to numb the excitement a little bit if we are overexcited and just again box clever do you know save your energy be clever about it yeah and then in that sense it would make say that person is uh looking looking at the longer bigger picture then it might make sense yes try try the 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 lower one you know the the challenge they call it in the in the adventure racing community the challenge race because then like if you're if you don't feel you're going to get that work done in those 10 weeks then it might be right to start there and just uh then promote up to the middle distance and and actually that's kind of something i'd like to say uh it's not necessarily a level of oh middle is less difficult than the longer one it's it's quite a different race you know it's a faster more intense pace oh again i'm probably talking at the competitive edge the competitive side to them but but then i'm kind of eating my words here because there is there can be a competitive nature with anyone entering this kind of this sort of an event you know because you said there you competing on your position from last year or the year before year, you know yeah we're always in some sense of comparison whether it's ourselves or our buddy who's doing it or whatever and speaking of buddies i'm only asking for a friend no i, I swear it's not me right but what does that that uh <laughs> what does that most basic the easiest one to get into how many kind of kilometers running how many kilometers cycling how many kilometers kayaking or what are we kind of looking at for the basic entry and so you mean that out of the three options the the lower one yeah I actually, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I could tell you like the middle one, which is the the option, which is the category that I race in. So typically it'll be about 40, 40 to, to 60 kilometers, 40 to 55 kilometers in that kind of region, right? And that could mean, I could give you, for example, the last race, which was Ken Mayer there before the whole curtain came down on, on fun or <laughs> on the events in Ireland, but uh, that one ran, you know, it was the first weekend in March and the first bike was 18 kilometers, which was tough because it was basically getting you out of Kenmare up into the hills. And then the next, then you transitioned, which means you dropped your bike at the bike rack and ran up Esk mountain, I think it was. And that was a was a eight kilometers, so it was four k up and four k down, and then you were back to the same bike transition. You grabbed your bike and you cycled sixteen kilometers back down into Kenmare, and then you had to throw the bike on another rack there. Oh, by you know that hotel in Kenmare, a nice one, um, the one at the top of the town, and you kind of ran then a kilometer down to the kayaks, and then it's usually a kilometer in the kayak. And then it was a kilometer to the finish line. So that might be your typical for that friend of yours, just to tell him what hmm. is ahead of him, you know, or her. Yeah. and, and Or you, or you, <laughs> or me. And like, that might sound, geez, that might sound like an awful lot, or it might sound like not much at all. But I suppose really, from my experience with doing any, I haven't done one of those particular races, but I've done similar events. And even the event itself distracts a bit from it that, you know, you don't notice that you're, running 10 kilometers the same way you would if you just went out on a Monday evening after work to your local park. It's different because yeah. there's people, there's something else pulling you around that your mind is elsewhere. Would you find that kind of thing to be true? Uh, d- definitely. I'm trying to remove my my competitive head at the moment, you know, but like, because w- w- like, I like you said in the start, yeah, chasing for podiums. So I'm basically chasing down the people in front of me. So it's nowhere near like a typical spin like I did this morning on the bike, you know. Yeah. But for someone who's, you say that person that we mentioned the first per, their first race, uh, they'll be carried along like it's that's why there's such a buzz about it is that there's a uh, there's just loads of people doing them at the moment. They're very popular, so there's plenty of, of people out there who are in the same boat. And you you mentioned you're you're competing, and you were talking earlier. You're offering a five percent bike fitting discount to anyone who gets out of your way in a race, isn't that it? Or or anyone who pushes an <laughs> opponent over? Was that was that what you were saying? Uh, 
Uh, it's funny you, asked, you said that because the, there was a, a joke last year. I was a, f- a guy who I was really close with. You know, he was coming fourth, I was coming fifth, and vice versa. And then I said, Liam, uh, come down to Cork there. We'll, we'll, we'll get you in for a bike fit. Uh, you know, I'll do you a deal, whatever. And uh, he was suspicious that I was going to drop his saddle below, you know, <laughs> to knock him down. Like, and uh, to, to get right into that, did you? <laughs> No, I, I, you know, ethics and morals, you know, that's how I, that's how I roll. Yeah, yeah. They're, they can be boring sometimes, but I suppose you have to, <laughs> you have to play by the rules. Um, uh, and I suppose, again, look, it's, it's March 23rd, um, 2020. I think, I don't know when we're listening to this, will 2020 have been a year that actually existed on the calendar or not? But mm. what are you doing? I suppose one is when's the next race? Probably the answer to that is God knows. And, Two, what are you doing to maintain your performance levels, to maintain, you know, your own sense of well-being, your own sense of fitness at the moment? I know you said you were st- you were out this morning, weren't you? Yeah, so and um, we don't really see each other or so we're not working anyway. And we're so I'm, I'm actually uh, training more than I ever did. No word of a lie. Like because <laughs> I took the turbo trainer home from the clinic and it's now sitting out in the shed and yeah when my i when my daughter's asleep i am following a training program and just giving it welly and then uh say when my wife is back so you know i'm out running yeah so i've got i'm doing a lot more to be honest because family got definitely took over there we'll say last year and i just was not in any way um strict with my training and i had a great year of the adventure race and so if it was the come back magically this year i'd I'd fancy myself but uh i don't know i think you said the next race it could be it might actually be for me it might actually be late august you know because i don't know if the one in june will go ahead the start of june yeah and the place we can we can hope and we can pray and we can do all those things but sure god knows as, Mm. as you say what way it'll go but i think you're hitting on something there that you know if anyone is at home and they're they're looking at the paint around the walls and things i mean just because we can't go to work or just because we can't go to the pub, just because we can't, I don't know, whatever we were used to doing doesn't mean that there's not plenty of other opportunities to be done. I mean, we're sitting here, it's a it's a Monday at, at five to four at the moment, and we might usually be with a client or something like that, but instead we're here. You yeah. know, we're we're having a conversation, we're opening up, we're connecting, so we're we're finding a different opportunity in it. You're you're mentioning your training. It's like, yeah, you can't go yeah, to a but- gym or you can't be out and about all that much, but you can still find other ways to make the most of it. And I think for any athlete, um, be it a, a, you know, an actual physical athlete or somebody who considers themselves a mental athlete in this world of chaos we're in, if we can maintain yeah. that sense of, you know, I can still go down kicking and screaming. I can still find a way to, to pump myself up, find a way to, to meander through, through the river, as, as so to speak. Um, I think that's a very, very important process that, but I hope some people out there that are listening that they're not allowing the the limitations yeah, it's, or so it's called. Very easy, isn't it? Yeah, so easy. It's yeah, like there's limitations. It's so easy to slip um, into that kind of. Um, my God, I know from ex- I know because it was happening to me. Like, okay, I was doing that session on the turbo trainer, but then I was just on the bloody phone so much, and I actually copped it uh, the other day, and and I said to my wife. That's it. I mean, I'm going to try a, 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 a phone constrained window, you know, so I'm going to use it between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. and 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Now, I've only this is only with the last like day. Right. So I'm full of beans, you know, but it it, it, it felt good yesterday because I, I had like 40 percent battery left on the thing at nighttime when normally with this week, with the way we're going, I was running out by by kind of noon. like so that's surely not good for anyone who's trying to cope and and stay productive and stay healthy to be just stuck to their phone. So I think that's a nice thing. I'd, I think would be, I mean, I don't know if you agree. When is the last time a a society or a government or or the orders that be have said to the people, okay, uh, go into your homes with your loved ones and do the inner work because that's all you can do. (laughs) I mean, that's a, it's a fantastic opportunity that to be honest, I thought would have been less likely to happen as the years went on, not more likely. And now we're in this, what, you yeah. know, we can make of it what we will. It could be a big 
kind of whether it's a spiritual overcoming or what for mankind, I don't know. But I think that there's a huge opportunity within this quiet space that we have, the boredom or the whatever we want to call it, to find out who we are ourselves, um, yeah. find out our demons, deal with all that shit if we have to, and then find out, okay, look, if the world can literally turn off the switch like this, then why why the fuck hold yourself back? Do you know? And, you know, why hold yourself back when when a disease or something like this can just make us seem so insignificant all of a sudden. There's no point holding it back. And then, then I don't know, maybe, maybe people who, okay, they might've enjoyed their last week or two of rest because we're kind of in that stage now where at the start, it was kind of nice, but Ooh, yeah. it's novel. It's novel. Yeah. It's no longer novel. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're getting into the gritty bit now where I think if you sit, like you said, it, use it now rather than just kind of I know I think we're, people were sort of getting a buzz off the fact that we were all being isolated but now it's the time to find something like um, I think a, a, a life audit you know go over now I'm just looking at a book here that I picked up and it, it's brilliant because it, it's, it helps guide you through different segments of your life so what's your social no, it's it's actually the life audit. <laughs> I'm plugging my my cousin's book, but uh, yeah, she she's that gir- that late that girl I referenced there at the beginning who um, yeah. who said about the why, you know, she's a clever cookie. Like she's a yoga instructor in in the west of Ireland, and uh, she life published audit. a book What's called the life audit. And yeah, Michelle, uh, Michelle Maroney, and she yeah like she it's all there like the stuff that she's talking about you know we all can get at it but the, the nice thing about the book is that it just steers you through and each month is a uh an area you can work on so your social life your spiritual your emotional very good and this is a chance i think for people to address those those areas you know as well as uh <laughs> doing the 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 fun like we got out there this morning and we were varnishing the shed there and then i just think that probably sent a few people out maybe the sun will help you know yeah oh there's so there's there's so many positives to be had and i know people are suffering i know people are scared and all of that but again we we must make it what we will and and you know that that whole thing of there really is positivity you know what might be at risk with people. Maybe people are cutting each other's throats at home. Um, because small talk will only take us so far. Yeah. I mean, people might be used to coming home and getting the "How was your day?" question. Well, no, that can't really yeah cut the mustard anymore. So no, I think people will have to bring the outer work out or bring the inner work out of each other. True or true or conversations. Conversations will have to get deeper. That's true. Uh, games will be played, and you know, people will make an absolute ass of themselves going wild with the game. But yeah. That's all okay, and that that's a fucking brilliant thing to see, you know. Yeah, that's uh, I never thought of that. Like, you know, it'll really give the the space for couples. I'm just thinking about couples, you know, where, uh, you know, if there's any kind of um cracks, geez, I think it'll probably expose them, won't it? And then, but then they might they might be good. That might allow them to talk it out and figure it out. Yeah, and f- for you know whether it ends one or whether it 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 rekindles one. I mean, either way, the truth has come out, you know, and that's. That's a big thing. People might be afraid of the truth if they don't like how it looks. But sometimes we just need to move past the fucking thing and get it out there and then we can reorientate or we can go forward even if it's a, a, a scary truth. You know, Again, this is the time to, to unravel all of that. I think it's a, a huge opportunity for mankind to to cut the bullshit once and for all and to cut the, the everything in the periphery and you know what the Kardashians yeah. say and what all these and blah blah yeah. blah and, and what we think is important. Whereas what's important is is just having a, a laugh, you know, having having a laugh and having something authentic. Yeah, and also being um to love your. To, uh, I know I've said it, but like, yeah, this book goes like figure out y- y- yourself, you know, because you have to know that you know, know yourself, then and then your relationships will will will, will be be for the better. That's a hundred percent, hundred percent. Because how how many of us? I like to ask the question. Say if we took a a CEO or a parent as an example and there's a CEO or a parent who will try and 
let's say, force their idea upon their employee or child. And they'll say, oh, I want you to be this way. And then they get angry and they project all of this nonsense on the person if they don't attain to that desire. Versus the type of CEO or parent who say, right, I'm going to do everything I can to give you the platform to be as awesome as you're able to be. Yeah. And, you know, option A or option B, I think we all know which one we'd prefer. The quickest one is Um, A, isn't it? A is... That's it. And it's more more common. We we try and project what we think should be the case on the people as opposed to maybe putting aside our own expectations, which is what we used to do as children before we knew anything about the world, and just see what happens, you know? See what comes out of it and, and... Hopefully then, because look, we have to spend time with each other. We have to nod. We have to smile. We have to say yes. We have to say no. Yeah. Is that we're able to help the other person in that conversation or that, that scenario. We help them articulate their own position and all of it as well. Do you know, I think that's an important thing that, you know, you mentioned uh, the likes of a couple who might both be working 40 hours a week yeah. and they come home. Their energy is probably still in work. Um, They might have three, four hours maybe together. Yeah. Um, before they go to bed but then there might be a yoga class there might be having to go for a cycle there might be a meeting there might be a J match all this different stuff yeah and it could take years for them to take years reach. to unravel it and now you know we have now it's like four four weeks six weeks you get enough done yeah yeah i think i think it's a huge opportunity um yeah yeah it's a good point huge opportunity but i suppose we just will start to wind up for today um within the next couple of minutes. Uh, and just to talk, I suppose, one is, is what are your work plans for the next kind of few weeks um, whilst all this is going on? Um, how, you know, how you're planning kind of being available to people and so on as, as best you can. Um, regardless of Corona, then what your plans are going forward, what your goals, dreams and visions. Um, and then any last bits of advice and different things. And if you want to plug, as I said, the likes of that book and you want to plug your different websites and social medias and such. Mm, yeah. Well, first you said, where, what am I planning? Well, I have decided, you see, I was struggling there last week. Right. And then Ashton said, what is wrong with you? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I think I said a lot of my, the way I was functioning was a lot of my energy went into my business or business. Right my bike fitting business the studio the just four years since i've come back from scotland building it up and now all like honest like the car that the rug was pulled underneath it like gone like there is no more requests for bike fitting there are no more patients coming for appointments or getting in touch with me and that i think hit me you know and uh but it was only when ashling asked me she goes what's up and i we talked about it and now I'm way, it's so effective, like, isn't it? Just talking, really, it's that simple. But uh, I am now a lot more accepting of this next, however long it will be, that, yeah, I'm going to just, I'm um, minding my daughter. We're spending loads more time together. It's good fun. She's got a good age. Like, she's about a year, and she's a year and seven months, so she's good crack. And I'm just accepting that. So I'm. that's what I'm doing right now uh, in saying that. I did manage to see one patient over a telehealth Zoom meeting. It was a young fella who sprained, he tore his calf muscle and his mom wanted him to show me how he had improved. So we arranged like a 15-minute call and ended up on WhatsApp video because she couldn't work out the Zoom thing. But yeah, it was good actually. You know, I could progress him on. He was fine. Hold on, just a second. So an Irish mammy couldn't figure out something on the internet machine? Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's very unusual. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so we just reverted to what's now considered bog standard WhatsApp video, you know. <laughs> that's the way to do it. So like the good old days with the wireless <laughs> the wireless radio as as my grandmother used to say. Oh, everything was on the wireless. Yeah. Simpler times, of course. But uh yeah, no, but in fairness that, that went well now. I don't know whether I want to uh try and push for that. I was gonna get in touch with you about that actually, whether we should put out a kind of a you know, a, an email to everyone saying that we're open for telehealth. But the other thing would be the, um, I'm going to prepare a presentation on, like we'll say, scientific training and nutrition. Or I was even looking at a, a, an adventure racing, you know, prepare for your next race, you know, through tra- training and nutrition. So I'll prepare a presentation and then invite people 
to come on line that evening and and basically watch the presentation from their own home awesome and you're you're on instagram and facebook right that's the bike fit physio uh the bike fit physio yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and for those who don't know and I, i'm i'm sure i'll end up recording it into our intro is you know you're also part of the life at studios with me yeah um so you can always that that's at life at studios you can always message that if you want to get in touch with john chat more about bike fitting chat more about all that kind of thing mm-hmm. um, and it doesn't stop there i think we, we we'll 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 move into other areas like where run fit is another part that i haven't really promoted enough but it's there you know and we i think we could move into teen fit if you're up for it absolutely age, well we already do something with age fit don't we we work we work with the uh, different groups and neurological conditions things like that yeah um, yeah yeah you know that's the thing i mean yeah in a sense we've we've general advice and we have general uh, belief systems that will you know guide our overarching specialities but there's loads of areas to be life fit whether that's in our running in our in our cycling yeah. in our mobility in our sense of play with the world that's a huge thing um yeah. you know all of these and and that's really I suppose that's a huge part for me and and I'm pretty sure you too from having been with you with the last few years is that the the mission to bring that forward or to at least create a space where people can come and experience that for themselves it's just majorly fulfilling and yeah look we're at a little bit of a roadblock at the moment but we'll figure out a way to yeah. to make it happen and this is part of that that podcast is part of that um yeah. I think that's huge you know and and that we both keep up the good work as best we can. Um, do you know? I, I'm feeling that people will be good to themselves once we're out of the the, uh, the confines, you know, once we're fin- once we're free. Like, maybe they'll come in their droves, you know, they'll go check out what we're doing down at the studio and be good to themselves, like, with a class or uh, maybe even a massage, you know? Yeah. Um, self look you know Absolutely. yeah definitely um come here we're going to leave it there today i have to go tell my dog that i love her all and, right uh, you know i haven't told her in a while um the kittens are taking over the the love they, they, my they... kittens uh they're still under the stairs there's four of the feckers um, i think they're two <laughs> they were two weeks old on saturday so the eyes are open um I, I, I listened to your first yeah your podcast where we we, we, we could bring the life of the kitten through kittens through your podcast you know right yeah. the way through it was uh, probably The Lion King was my favorite movie as a child, so maybe that's where it all comes back to. Though I don't think I can name them all Simba. <laughs> maybe I'll have to name one Scar, uh, even though you know nobody might like that cat. Um, yeah. Mufasa and, and Nela, I suppose that'll be the. Yeah, 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 yeah. That shows my knowledge. Oh, geez, that was a good one. I didn't think I'd remember all all those it's, years ago. It, um, wait, wait, when you put yourself in these positions, huh? It comes to you, doesn't it? Second comes, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like a light of inspiration. Um, I so really enjoyed, it. really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, we're we're gonna leave it there. So I will say goodbye to you. Um, my regards, of course, on to your two ladies in your life. Um, and mind yourself, keep training, and I'll definitely be chatting to you soon. And again, for our audience, if you want to hear more on John, check him out on Instagram and Facebook. He is the Bike Fit Physio. So John, all the best, yeah, and I'll chat to you soon. Good luck, good luck. Ciao. So that was all for today with myself and John. Remember, if you like the show, why not check us out on Patreon where every donation counts. That is the Life Fit Podcast on Patreon. We're also on Instagram. We are at Life Fit Studios or you can find my personal page at Jack O'Halloran underscore IE or you can find John's bike fitting page that is the Bike Fit Physio. Our websites are lifefitstudios.ie and thebikefitphysio.com. So thank you very, very much for tuning in. I appreciate your time and I appreciate all that you give to us here on the show. You really are an absolute rock to us. We wouldn't have the show without you guys. So keep it all up. Hope you enjoy your quarantine wherever you are and be good to yourselves. Yours in health, Jack. Mm -hmm.